Well, welcome back to our online Bible study that we call God's Message to the Church in These Last Days. We've been looking at Revelation chapter 6. We have looked at the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And now we're going to the fifth seal that the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, opens up and reveals what's going on. So we've looked at the rider of the white horse, and as we said before, the rider of the white horse goes forth conquering and to conquer. But the way that the white horse rider conquers is through ideology. Winning the, the uh, world view, changing the world view of people, getting them not to think according to the Bible, and getting them not to use the Bible as their standard for living. I think uh, someone said that one of the greatest generations in history was those that their parents had taught them the Word of God and that they knew to respect and honor and to uh, do what the Word of God had to say and that they you know, were a generation that had integrity, they had honesty, they had respect, but then transition that, and that was just a few generations ago, but transition that to what we see today. Now we have so much disrespect. We do not honor those in positions of authority. We have no respect for the flag or the national anthem or for anyone who, call, <clears throat> who calls themselves Christians. How did we get in this position? It's because that it has been slowly and subtly uh, taught and propagated in our society to such an extent. I mean, we've had it in media, we have it in education, we have it in our government, and so, the enemy has infiltrated into these spheres of influence and people have over time just accepted these things and have not pushed back on it. We haven't stood up. We haven't taken a stand for what is right. We've been silent for too long. And when good people do nothing, then that's when evil can prevail. But then after that, we saw the rider of the red horse who goes forth with the great sword who kills. And so that is to depopulate the earth. That is the another agenda of those who want to rule and reign the earth. Especially you want to depopulate those areas where they're... Uh, that you can't dominate or you can't control because of their ideology, that they won't listen to you, that they'll push back. So you have to destroy those groups of people. And then we saw as a result of the Great War, it always leads to economic situations. If you have devastation, if uh, businesses are destroyed, if in infrastructure is destroyed as well, then this certainly does affect the economy of your country. And I think about Syria as a good example that it was it has been just devastated by all the different groups of people that have been in there and the destruction that has taken place and the displacement of the people there in the Middle East as they have migrated into Europe and other parts of the world. It's a really sad situation in Iraq and Syria and in those areas that it is such devastation. And of course that hurts, that affects you economically. And then followed by that you have the pale horse. You know, when you have disease and pestilence and wild beast and those kinds of things, when people are starving to death, when there is droughts, um, when the weather patterns change, and the weather pattern, by the way, can be manipulated 
And so uh, you can affect the weather, weather patterns and uh, so that has a devastation, a devastating effect on people as well. But this fifth seal, I love this picture right here because it is showing Jesus putting on the white robe on this uh, man. And uh, we'll see here what this is about. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, it said, when he, when Jesus opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood? on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who should be or who would be killed as they were was completed. So as we begin looking at this scripture, it says the fifth seal is opened and this is all part and parcel of what has transpired in the other four seals, that this is part of it. Like I said, one of the things is that you have to destroy the ideology of those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to destroy their belief in the Word of God. And if you can't, if you can't, get people to submit and go along with your ideology, then the next step is just get rid of them and to kill them because of their faith. That's the only reason that you, uh, that you have martyrs is that a martyr will not uh, deny their faith. They will stand up for what they believe. And so notice that it said, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain. So you think about uh, in the tabernacle that there were two altars. There was the altar of uh, burnt offering where the sacrifice was completely burned up. And they would have the ashes underneath the altar. And then you also had the altar of incense. And this is where uh, the scripture describes the incense as the prayers of the saints. So they would take, the priest would take maybe some of the blood from the altar of burnt offering and sprinkle it upon the altar of incense and some of the other items in the holy place. So you have two different things here, I think, uh, when you talk about the altar. Under the altar, those who had been slain, that they were on the altar of sacrifice, the altar of the burnt offering. These are those who gave their whole life for the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's what the burnt offering was. All the parts of the animal was to be burnt up. It was a dedication, if you will. It was You were dedicating your whole life to the Lord. And that's what the, these that have been slain, that's what that represents. They were willing to lay everything on the altar. Jesus said, that if we are to be his disciples, that we have to take up our cross and follow him. We have to count the cost. We have to be willing to give our entire life and lay it all on the altar to the Lord. That we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto the Lord, holy and acceptable to him, which is our spiritual worship. So to be able to 
dedicate your entire life to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the early disciples did. They were willing to take up their cross and follow after Jesus. But also, you know, there on the altar of incense, this was the prayers of the saints. So it, it says that they had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So again, they believed in the word of God. They were willing to die for what the word of God had to say. And they were willing to stand up and testify. They were not ashamed of the gospel. They did not keep silent. They spoke out. They, you know, they, when intimidated, they would say we would, we would refuse to renounce the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it says, um, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had man maintained. You see, Christians and Jews stand in the way of what those in the world, those elite, those who have wealth and power, we stand in the way of what they want to do. They want to conquer the world, you see. And they want to dominate the world, but you see, we are standing in their way, so they want to get us out of the way. Now, verse 10, it says, They called out in a loud voice, How long, Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? You see, there's something innately in us that we want justice. You know, as your little kid, you want your parents to punish somebody that does wrong. You say, Mama, Daddy, I want you to, you need to get, do something to my brother or my sister. Look what they've done. You know, we just have that sense of justice within us. And the same thing was true with these that had been martyred. They were saying, how long before you do something about these people and what they did to us? There needs to be justice. And so that is our cry for justice. You know, when we look at the way things are and we see what those who have had power and how they have killed and they've murdered and they've stolen and they've done all kinds of ungodliness, we want to say, Lord, how long before you do something about this and bring justice and avenge us? But then in verse 11, it says, Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. So the persecution is going on. The key word here is altar. The altar was a place of sacrifice. So here's some key points from verses 9 through 11. In verse 9 it says, Death ushers the believers into the presence of God. So what is death like? Well, death means that we, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Number two, the world hates believers. That's what I've been trying to point out. Because we get in the way of those who want the new world order, who wants to set up their own form of government where they have all the power and wealth of the world and that we're just the peons that has to be their slaves or their servants. Number three, God will avenge the wrongs done to his servants, but not yet. Not yet for these uh, martyrs. And number four, the prayers of believers are effective. God does hear the prayers of his people. Now, he may not answer as quickly as we would like, but he says 
There is a time, and he waits until the fullness of iniquity, that there is a fullness of iniquity. He says there's others that will go through just the same thing that you have gone through. But when that is complete, then there will be justice that will take place. Number five, believers who have died are at rest in God's presence. So that's another thing to know that the striving is over, that their work has been completed here in this age. That doesn't mean that we stop and that there's nothing that we do when we get to the other side. It just means that things will change, that what we have done here on earth, well, that's complete while we're still in this physical body, but we will have um, a greater work. We will be servants of the Most High God for now and all eternity. We are his servants. I remember Jesse Luplantis, he said when he went to uh, paradise and he saw David and uh, Abraham and an angel and he was even taken to the throne room of God that one of the things that um, he was asking I believe it was David maybe or maybe the angel uh, no I think it was David that said to him he looked at the throne room and he said well here's the 24 thrones around the throne room of God but there's nobody there and he says, where are they? And David told them, we're servants. We're, they're out serving people. That's what we do. We go and serve other people. We just don't sit around and do nothing. But we're servants of the Most High God. So I like that. To know that we are servants of God and we're servants of one another that there's still work to do, but it's, it's not the same work as uh, we have at this moment. And then number six, God uses man's sin to accomplish his purposes. And then our sufferings are included in God's plan. So God knows all of these things, and these things will all be completed. But the big question that the martyrs have is how long until you do something about it? Here they're told that they should rest yet a little while. Just rest. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Okay, so get rid of the stress. Just rest in God's presence. Yet for a little while, until your fellow servants also and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. How long until you come? That's the question, isn't it? That we always want to ask. How long, Lord? This is in Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle, wrestle with my thoughts? And day after day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? You know, for us, it seems like an eternity. But with God, it's just a moment in time. It's like a day is like a thousand years and a year is, uh, you know, a thousand years is like a day. So with God, time is meaningless. But for us, it seems like forever. He says, will you forget me forever? No. But sometimes we do have to be patient in what we're going through. And sometimes it seems like God may be far away. He says, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts and have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? These are human reactions to what we go through. But if we can just understand this principle of just resting and knowing that God in his own timing will bring things to fruition. And if we can learn to be patient, to have endurance, that's a big thing. That's a big problem, especially in our culture 
where we want everything instantly. You know, if, even on computers, if it doesn't come, bring things up as fast as we would like it, we get impatient and we're saying, oh, this is taking too long. You know, we're not willing to wait. We haven't learned that art of having patience and endurance and perseverance. But we have to learn these disciplines because things has a, you know, you have a process that things have to go through and you just can't rush through things sometimes. And God, in his wisdom, he knows better than we do what, when, and how things need to be accomplished, that there is due diligence that we have to go through. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, here's what Paul said. So we do not lose heart, though our outward self is wasting away. <clears throat> our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, or they, they're, they just last for a little while, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul described it as a momentary affliction. Again, it, to us it may seem like an eternity, but in God, from God's perspective, it's just a moment in time. And so that's what Paul learned. He learned to be content in all circumstances. And he learned that this is just momentary and that it will not last. This too shall pass. So if we can learn that lesson that we just told on, just like Paul and Silas who were in a prison cell in Philippi, they were not grumbling and complaining being in the dungeon of a prison and having been beaten and bloody. You know, they, they were not complaining about it. Actually, they began to sing hymns to the Lord. And whenever the earthquake took place and the prison doors were opened, they were not rushing out of there. And the prison guard, he said, he thought all of his prisoners had escaped. But Paul said, no, we're in here. We're not in a hurry. You know, you'd think that they would be wanting to get out of that prison as soon as possible. But when the prison guard came around and he was about to kill himself because he thought he'd lost all of his prisoners, Paul says, no, we ain't gone anywhere. We're still here. Don't worry about it. And he led this man and his household to the Lord as a result. But you see this picture, Revelation 16, how long, O oh Lord, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? It looks, you know, it's painful when you go through difficulties and when you are being persecuted. Again, it is painful and it hurts. And you want it to be over with. And you want justice to be served. But again, God says you've got to be patient. Now here was an article. It was uh, in 2014. It was by Theodore Shubat, Shubat. And it says, Muslim rape Christian women. 600 Christians takes up arms and makes one final and heroic stand against Muslim jihadists. And this is Bartella on the outskirts of Mosul, Iraq. And it says, These 600 Christians, all mighty men of valor, who have fulfilled the words of Christ when he said, Whoever loses their life for me will find it. Scripture agrees to take up arms. Captain Faraz Jacob, a Christian warrior, said, 
I stand here waiting for my destiny. We will stay here despite everything. All these armed groups we have seen, but nevertheless, we will remain. We love our Christian way of life. We love our churches and we love our community. Victory lies at the end of these men's fate, for they shall find it either with themselves, still breathing and standing above the corpses of their enemies, or after the last breath departs from their martyred bodies. So here were Christian men who were willing to stand up for what they believed, and they were willing to lay down their lives, whatever it took. But, you know, here, Christian women that were raped and their men stood up against all odds, standing up for what they believed. They loved their community. They loved their faith. And they were willing to pay whatever price was necessary. We think about what Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verses 9 through 14. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Well, we're seeing that in the news today when there are television programs that were mocking, mocking um, Pence and his faith and just making, uh, just ridiculing him. And we see that there are those in our culture, in our nation, who hates Christians and who are going to mock and persecute uh, those who stand up for their faith. But again, we have to be willing to stand up for what we believe and, and not allow those who persecute us to put us down and or to stop us, to stop us from speaking out from giving our witness, our testimony to others. But anyway, you'll be hated by all nations for my namesake. Verse 10, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. So we have to have endurance. We have to endure to the end. We're in a race, as Apostle Paul says, that we are, let us persevere. Persevere. That we have a race that is set before us, and we have to run that race with perseverance. And we have to look unto Jesus. This is in Hebrews where it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So how could Jesus endure the pain and suffering that he faced? It's because he was looking beyond that suffering to the joy that was set before him of the lives that would be changed and, and just transformed because of what he did on the cross. That was the joy that was set before him, so he was willing to pay the price. So in verse 13, the one who endures to the end will be saved. We've got to endure. Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed, this gospel of the kingdom, that the kingdom of God is at hand, that Jesus is coming. And it won't be very long now. We have Billy Graham that just died. And I believe that's a sign that we are in the end times. That it's just like the end of one age has just ended. All the great men of faith that started around the 50s and had such a tremendous impact on the world, now they're gone. And I believe that that is a sign to us that we are in the end times, in this age, not the end of the world, but the end of this age, that Jesus is going to return very, very soon. And this gospel of the kingdom 
The good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Sure, as we proclaim the gospel, it will not be received by everyone. They'll hate us. We think about throughout history, those that went to the guillotines. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, it says they have conquered him by, you know, the Antichrist, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. You know, it's our salvation. It's, it's when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and his shed blood, his sacrifice for our sins, and then the word of our testimony as we share our story with others. It says, for they love not their lives unto the death. That's the way one translation says it. But this translation says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Why share my testimony? Why not? That's the story that we have to tell to the nations. We have a story to tell to the nations. We have a story to tell of how the Lord Jesus Christ transformed our lives and what a difference that he's made in our, our lives. He's given me a peace and a joy and a love and he has filled my life with his Holy Spirit. He has changed me forever and so I want to tell everyone that Jesus Christ can do the same for you. You don't have to live a life of hopelessness or misery or pain. That even in your sorrow, even in your grief, even in your struggles, that you can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. So and you can have a peace that passes all understanding, even in the midst of turmoil. That's my story. And that's what we are to share. We think about throughout history, we think about the Roman Colosseums, and we see, you know, the lions that were unleashed. And you also see those that are up on the crosses and are being crucified. And, and you see that one man in the background where he has a fire lit underneath him so they were burning them and they were crucifying them and they were throwing them to the lions and he had coliseums this was their form of rec recreation is to watch the christians be executed to be eaten by lions torn apart you know they would starve the lions and then put them out into the arena and they see all these people and so yeah they go and attack because they're starving and so the Christians, I mean, that was just a form of entertainment. How, how distorted, how evil, how ungodly, how, um, I don't know, what has happened to people's minds that they would want to view what was taking place like this. But then we see what's happening today, how they're setting people on fire, how they're tearing down crosses, how they're persecuting those for their faith. Or you look at the picture here of these uh, Egyptian Christians, these followers of the Egyptian, you know, of the faith of Jesus Christ, and how they martyred them, that they beheaded them. This is the voice of the martyrs right here. But then you look at this picture, and it's showing the scripture there from Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, that we have we're studying in this lesson these men who gave their lives because they were standing up for what they believed and you see during world war one oh i'm sorry world war two how there were christians the resistant fighters in world war two who were killed because of their faith you think about uh, Corey Tim Boone and her family and how they were involved and how they were helping Jews trying to rescue them, trying to stand up for them. And then you see those on the right, the Egyptians who were martyred.
because of their faith. They, they would not renounce their faith in Jesus Christ. And then you see something like this. Jihad against the USA is our religious duty. Why do they hate us? It's because we stand up for the Jews. And they're against, you know, they want to wipe out the Jewish people. That's their goal. And because we are standing with them, then they want to destroy us. So here we are in the midst of these times. And then, you know, verse 11, it says they, they were each given a white robe. They were given a white robe and told to rest a little longer, to rest a little longer. Even though they wanted to see justice served, the Lord was telling them, don't worry about it. It will happen. They will receive their reward. They will be punished for all eternity. But, um, you know, it's just like Pharaoh. God gave Pharaoh 11 different opportunities to repent and change his mind. Why didn't he stop Pharaoh at the first instance? He gave, you know, plague after plague, and Pharaoh would say, okay, okay, pray for me and get rid of this plague for me. And so his repentance was not real, but God kept giving him <clears throat> instance after instance where Pharaoh could have repented. He could have changed. At one point, he actually said, I have sinned. Pray for me. So he realized that he had sinned. But then when the plague was removed, then he reverted back and he says, oh, well, you know, everything's fine now. Everything's cool. I'm not going to do what I promised. So he, he, he really was not sincere in what he did. But notice... Here it says, each were given a white robe. A white robe was given to each of them. It was presented to them. That was their reward, that they were part of the redeemed of the Lord. The part of the redeemed, there were, how many were there? We don't know the exact number of those that were redeemed, but all wearing white robes. This is our badge of honor. This represents the fact that we belong. You know, when you play on a team, on a sports team, you have a certain uniform that you wear. Or on the Olympics, you wear a certain gear to represent where you're from. Well, here is our uniform, if you will. This is the team that we belong to, the team of the Lord. So... What is the message here? Well, we have seen that we are living in those days where Christianity and the Jewish faith is being persecuted, that we're being hated, that those in the news media, those in entertainment, those in um, academia, they hate the name of Jesus Christ. But again, we are to remain faithful unto death, faithful to the very end. And that's what God has promised. But he says, you know, there is a reward. There is a reward awaiting you. So just rest. Just be patient. Don't get upset. It's coming. And I know that there's going to be a cleansing of our nation that those who have been wicked and ungodly in positions of power in our nation, their day is coming. Just wait. They're going to get their just desserts. God is going to give to them what they deserve. He's being patient. He's allowing them time. Even, you know, it's not his will that any should perish. So he is, you know, he is willing to give anyone an opportunity to repent. But then there comes the day that there is no repentance. That 
just like with Pharaoh, it said that God at that point hardened his heart. And there was a point of no return when you continue to uh, turn away from the Lord and you keep resisting the Holy Spirit. There comes that point in time when he says, that's enough. That's it. It's over. So even though we're living in difficult days, hold on and look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So look beyond the circumstances that we're facing now. Look beyond that and know that the day is coming when we will be rewarded and that we will see Jesus face to face. And then we'll be part of his kingdom and we will go forth as his people and you know in his kingdom there will be nations there will be cities there will be work to do we will be learning continuously throughout eternity there is so much that we have to learn and to do there will be technology that will blow your mind there will be discoveries that will just, you know, whenever you discover something new, it's like, wow, you know, it's, it's so good. So there will be so many things to discover, so many things to learn that we have so much to look forward to. We're not just going to sit around on a cloud playing a harp unless, you know, music is our uh, talent, our gift, our ability. Yeah, there will be places of music where we will learn and there will be musical instruments and you know there the depths we haven't really discovered the depths i know that uh don piper said that when he went to heaven for 90 minutes he said you could hear different music coming from different places and they would be singing different songs or playing different music music but it all blended together that there was no disharmony whatsoever. Well, that's part of the things that we'll discover as well. How can you do that? How can you do that when you have all different kinds of music and that they would totally just blend together without disharmony? So again, Father, we just thank you and we bless you. Thank you that you give us this encouragement to not give up, to endure to the end, that your purposes will be fulfilled. We have a destiny to fulfill while we're here. Just like Esther, who was told, who knows that you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And she said, okay, if I perish, I perish. Pray for me. I'll do what I'm supposed to do. So that's what we need to do is just commit ourselves to him and trust in his unchanging love. And we bless you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.